All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar on all about the books for the NEA Big Read. And my name is Joshua Feist. I'm the director of grant making at Arts Midwest. And Arts Midwest administers the NEA Big Read on behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm a white male. I use he, him pronouns. I'm wearing a purple shirt. Before we proceed, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. We are recording this session for anyone that couldn't attend live, and we will post the recording on the Arts Midwest YouTube channel, as well as on the Arts Midwest website when we've had a chance to make some polishing edits. Subtitles and captioning is being provided automatically by Zoom, so you can view or hide those by using the uh, closed captioning or live transcript button that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom window. All participants are muted during this presentation. And while you're welcome to use the chat feature to share thoughts and comments throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions, which we will do our best to address towards the end. If you're using the chat, please make sure you select all participants, uh, all panelists and attendees so that other folks can see. You'll be hearing from several new authors as well as the National Endowment for the Arts representatives in a few minutes. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd like to run through the agenda for today. So in the, in the near term, we're gonna give an intro to the program just in case um, anyone is brand new. Uh, then we'll be briefly covering the list of books and Lauren at the NEA will be helping us with that. And then we're gonna go into about a 15 to 16 minute uh, video of the authors presenting their um, books for your consideration as you apply to this grant program. After that, we're gonna delve deeper into each book and talk about each one a little bit more in depth. And then we'll have a Q and A at the end. So let's make sure we're all clear on what uh, we're talking about today. So. The NEA Big Read is essentially a nationwide grant program that's about presenting the themes of one of the designated NEA Big Read books to your community through an artistic lens. The ultimate goal is to um, broaden community engagement with the text at the same time as inspired by the artistic and creative events that you conceive of. And each program that uh, you propose should always tie back to the book in some way. And we know from research that reading together invites dialogue, understanding, and empathy between people. And through the process of the whole community reading the same book at the same time, the community becomes smaller, more closely knit, and people can walk a mile in another person's shoes via the content of the book. And it's about discovering great literature, inspiring conversations, and building communities. Uh, by the way, uh, we talk a lot more in depth about building programs and the application process itself in a webinar we did uh, just last month. So we'll throw that link in the chat uh, so you can also um, get access to that in case you're curious about going into depth on that. And I'll be around to answer more questions regarding the application process after we talk more about the books during this presentation. So now I'm going to hand things over to Lauren Miller from the National Endowment for the Arts. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, like Josh said, I am Lauren Miller and I am the program manager for the Big Read at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm a white female, use she, her pronouns, and I'm wearing a long sleeve pink shirt. And on the screen here are the 15 titles available for programming for the 2022-23 programming year, which we'll get into greater detail in just a little bit. So we've learned a lot in the past five years of this program, and we're always trying to learn what books work best for community read programs and also how many book choices to offer each year. Our current thinking that perhaps 30 was a bit too many, perhaps a bit overwhelming, um, but six was a little too few. So this year we moved forward with 15 selections. Assuming that these books are well received, um, we are going to try to keep these titles on the list for at least two grant cycles. Um, that means 2022, 23, and 23, 24. 
Suggestions for new titles are collected from a wide variety of sources, including readers from around the country. There is a suggest a book form on our website, arts.gov slash NEA Big Read, where you can provide recommendations. And we also receive recommendations from NEA Big Read grantees, participants, and past Big Read panelists. The National Endowment for the Arts then seeks advice from additional readers, literary presenters, and community organizers nationwide to help narrow the list down based on the list of suggestions based on our criteria. Josh, could you advance the slide? Thanks. So on this page, you can see our book selection criteria, which, which are books that can unite communities through lively and deep discussions and innovative programming, stories that provide glimpses into personal lives told through the lens of universal themes, writing that sings on the page, which with the potential to entice reluctant laughs and avid readers alike, authors who speak to the issues of our times and the countries we live in, and especially authors who enjoy visiting communities in person or online, and choices that offer a range of voices, genres, settings, perspectives, and experiences. We'll get into more details of these 15 titles soon, um, but all the titles may not be appropriate for all age groups, but we really encourage communities to find companion titles that works well with their chosen title and various age groups. For example, picture books, YA books, poetry collections, graphic novels, et cetera. I will now pass it back over to Josh um, to introduce our author videos. All right, thank you, Lauren. I'm happy to share with you some recordings that we gathered from most of the new authors. Uh, we asked them to describe their books to you so you have some context about what they're about and the themes contained within them. Now this will be about a 16 minute video in total and afterwards uh, Amy Stoles from the National Endowment for the Arts along with the rest of the uh, group uh, will delve into each title a little bit more thoroughly. So give me a chance to bring the video up and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Rebecca Tossig, author of Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body. And I'm so excited that my book is part of the 2022-23 NEA Big Read. One of the reasons I wrote this book was because I didn't have anything like it when I was growing up. Uh, I grew up paralyzed and moved through the world uh, in a little hot pink wheelchair. Um, and if I saw stories that included disability at all, they were more often than not flat and trite, uh, oversimplified or sensationalized. So Sitting Pretty is a memoir and essays that tells honest, funny, sometimes heartbreaking, but thought provoking stories about my life as a disabled woman. Uh, I think this book is all about connections between neighbors. It's about sparking conversations that don't have easy answers, but matter for all of us. It's really exciting to have the story live on. Um, and it's wonderful to be part of a, a theme about connecting neighbors because I've always thought of it um, not necessarily as just an immigrant or a refugee story, but as an American story. Um, my family is not special, um, as I say in the intro of the book. Uh, we're very typical of a lot of uh, refugee and immigrant families. And it often takes decades uh, to unravel the knot that is that experience. And so I'm uh, very fortunate to have two parents who let me share our family's story. Um, and I hope that um, communities can use my family's story to delve into the incredible complexities um, that exist within families like ours, the journeys we've gone through and the um, things that we pass down uh, from generation to generation, some of, some of which are pretty hard to talk about. Um, and I hope that our experience can be used to understand 
many experiences that um, have uh, come to the U.S. and continue to. Hi, everyone. My name is Yad Jesse, and I am the author of Homegoing. And I'm so excited that my book is part of the 2022-2023 NEA Big Read. Homegoing is a novel that follows the family lineage of two half-sisters born in the Gold Coast in the 18th century. The first sister, Afia, is the wife of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle, which was the seat of British colonial rule in what is now known as Ghana. Essie, her half-sister, was kept in the dungeons of that same castle before being sent through the Middle Passage to America, where she would be enslaved. The novel moves down the lineages, generation after generation, ending in the present day. It takes you through things like the Fugitive Slave Act, the Civil War and Reconstruction. It takes you through the Yaasantwa War and the advent of cocoa farming in Ghana. It is a book that attempts to grapple with histories, both large and small, personal and political. And I think that you'll have many great discussions around this book. This is a book that I wrote about my parents um, and specifically about the last 10 years or so of their lives and my experience with taking care of them. Um, and uh, I was an only child. Uh, I, so the taking care of two elderly people, they were in their 90s, um, it pretty much fell to me. I have to say that one of the reasons I wrote it was because the experience was extremely surprising to me. This was a part of life that was so little talked about um, on any level. I really had no idea what to expect, what services were out there, what other people had gone through. Uh, I had many emotions during the experience um, some happy, some not so happy, a lot of frustration, a lot of sadness. Um, sometimes things were funny. Uh, and uh, I'm a cartoonist, so I guess I tend to look at things from a certain point of view. Um, the novel is about a young woman, uh, Lillian, uh, who reconnects with a friend from high school, Madison, who now uh, lives in a huge mansion, uh, is married to a senator who has designs on being the president. Um, but she needs Lillian to take care of her two stepchildren, uh, these twins. And the catch is that when they get agitated, uh, they burst into flames, uh, literally. Uh, so it's a novel about uh, children who catch on fire. Uh, but it's more than that. Uh, over the course of this summer, uh, Lillian, who's had a life that hasn't been what she'd hoped for, what she'd wanted, uh, spends this single summer with Madison and with these children in the hopes of reconciling her past, um, figuring out how to live in the present, and to actually imagine a future. Infinite Country is a story about a Colombian family fractured by immigration and deportation. It's told over 20 or so years, beginning in the late 1990s through the turn of the millennium and ending up uh, around 2016, 2017. It tells a story about a mixed status family where there are both citizen, documented and undocumented family members and how they navigate being together and separated um, over years as laws change and their countries, United States and Colombia change all around them. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I'm Charles Yu, author of Interior Chinatown, and I'm excited that my book is part of the upcoming NEA Big Read program. Interior Chinatown is a story principally of a guy named Willis Wu, who exists as a background Asian man in a police procedural show known as Black and White. And Willis's story is one of a guy who really isn't part of, of the action, who has no lines, um, and who in the course of the book uh, tries to become part of the plot of the story. And in doing so takes on a series of roles um, some of which um, take him to unexpected places. And uh, I think the story is really um, one for anyone who can identify with being on the margins, who feels or has felt like um, that, the, that things don't really, you know, that they're not part of the action and anyone who feels like an outsider really. Um, and specifically uh, for me, it was a way into exploring aspects of the Asian American experience, um, or at least uh, parts of the Asian American experience that I and um, my family can identify with. When I set out to write this novel about the last two people left on Earth, I was not considering the possibility of human extinction. I wanted to turn a bedtime story I used to tell my children about a talking bear into a coming-of-age novel that addressed the depths of human loss. In the early days of writing, though, I was fishing near my house in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire, and I was struck by the beauty of the lake, the forest, and the mountain on a day when I felt completely alone. I thought, I wonder what this place is going to be like for the last. And that's when it struck me, just what the bear wanted to become. I rode to shore, sat down at my writing desk, and wrote that first sentence. The last two were a girl and her father who lived along the old Eastern Range. The novel still struggled with how a father would raise his daughter living close to the land and in the wake of great loss. But there was something about contemplating the essential and existential finality of the human story that kept raising question after question for me and the bear. Why are they alone? How do they live day by day? And, and how is that knowledge passed along? And, if, and, and what is their purpose if they know they're the last? I have loved a Greek mythology since I was a child, and I've always been really excited about the character of Circe, the witch from the Odyssey who infamously turns Odysseus's men into pigs. But the part that really drew me to her story wasn't necessarily the part that was about ancient mythology, um, because in the context of this story of gods and heroes and monsters, I saw the story of a woman who was struggling to find her voice, struggling to find her power in a world that is profoundly hostile to her. The fact that Circe to me was the story of an artist, a woman finding her craft, finding her power and finding her place in the world. Um, along with all those monsters and gods and minotaurs at the same time. Um, it was also a really uh, a feminist story from the beginning for me. I love the fact that I was looking at sort of voices that had been silenced in the original material, not just Circe, but many of the other women around her story, um, and even some of the, the men as well. Um, these characters who had been forced into very constricted roles. It was really fun to write this story and give them the chance to breathe. Heartland is the intergenerational story of my family's struggle with poverty. Uh, it's really a book about socioeconomic class, which I believe is an underdiscussed and poorly articulated uh, concern and identity marker in the United States. So while it is a memoir um, and it uh, includes a good deal of my upbringing in the latter 20th century, in rural poverty on a wheat and cattle farm in South Central Kansas. It is, I hope, a springboard to um, discussion about and consideration of the ways in which public policy and popular culture and these sort of external forces um, affect and impact and, and uh, mold our interior and private and very intimate domestic lives.
I like to think of Death Republic as the last story in Bond about how silence can bring communities together or pull them apart. It's a story of a pregnant woman and her husband who, in the middle of civic unrest, watched the soldier shoot and kill a young deaf boy. And in response to that murder, they see the whole community stand up and refuse to hear the authorities. The protest is sometimes coordinated by sign language. The book asks us to consider what silence means to us. The beautiful, intimate, silent moments between lovers and the terrifying silence of people who refuse to stand up and protest the violence. Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, it's it's a book about many things, you know, and I think I've been told that it's a book um, part about joy. And so in that way, the book feels important to me because it's been a book, um, having conversations about this book with other people has been a chance for me to sort of deeply or more deeply sort of think about this subject of joy. And when I say joy, I mean, it's very complicated experience or this complicated endeavor or um, or entering that we do together. Um, and, and which is to say that there are poems in here that are profoundly elegiac. There are poems for loved ones who are who have died. And there are also poems that are sort of obvious <coughs> odes and celebrations. Often those things go together in this book. I think often those things go together, but in this book maybe particularly. Cold Millions is a historical novel, a rollicking adventure story about Gig and Rye Dolan, two orphans who get caught up in the free speech battle of the early 1900s in the West. It's also about two remarkable women they meet, the vaudeville performer Ursula the Great, who sings and dances on stage with a wild cougar, and the courageous real-life 19-year-old labor activist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. The novel touches on issues our country is dealing with right now, income inequality, homelessness, representation, police brutality, and the power of protest, putting those issues in historical context. back and I just wanted to uh, introduce the Director of Literature at the National Endowment for the Arts, Amy Stoltz, who will be taking us through a book by book discussion for further context of each one of these titles. Amy, off to you. Oh, thanks, Josh. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I, uh, I get excited every time I see that video of, for all the books. I'm Amy, as Josh said, I'm the Director of Literary Arts at the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you for joining us. Um, I thank you also to Lauren Miller on our NEA team for her guidance and excellent management of this program on our end and a huge congratulations and uh, thanks to the team at Arts Midwest, John, Alana, Mia, Josh, especially, and a shout out to Emma for her book recommendations and thoughtful input. We have them to thank for the terrific video you just saw and their superb facilitation and promotion of the entire Big Read granting program. So you may have gleaned thus far from Lauren and Josh that arriving at a list of books that work well for this program is no small task. It takes us all year, like every year, and it takes a whole lot of reading and researching and discussing with all sorts of folks. And there are 
I mean, let's face it, many more books that could work for a program like this. So I, I wanted to say that we're not making any claims that these are the only ones that could work, or nor are we trying to predict the future by saying these are destined to endure or be instant classics, but we hope that they will be, of course. Um, we're simply saying to try these ones, these books, you know, these books and these authors are really something. And we think you'll find them fascinating and fascinating stories and ideas and perspectives inside their pages that are worth talking about and responding to. So I'd like to offer just a little bit more information on each big read title to perhaps aid your selection. And then we can open this meeting up to questions. And by the way, all of these books um, are available in paperback. So for next slide up. Uh, start with there, there. Tommy Orange sent his apologies that he couldn't send in a video in time for this webinar. He's out on the road again for the first time since the pandemic. And he's also a dad, so you know how that goes. But he's excited to be part of the program. In fact, he wrote, wow, so cool um, when we told him the news. There, there won the Penn Hemingway Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, among other awards, and was on many best books of the year lists. It's gripping, it's gritty, it's beautiful, it's sometimes amusing, and it's emotionally gut-punching. It is available on audio, braille, and in Spanish. So I'm to say that. And also it was touted by School Library Journal as one of their picks for best adult books for teens, um, as there are teenage characters in the mix. Um, and the novel's publisher, Penguin Random House, also selected it as a secondary education pick. So if you Google all that, you'll find that they offer up or look online, offer up discussion questions and whatnot on uh, the publisher's site. Um, and the novel del delve into issues of native identity in American culture um, historically, but especially in modern times, um, and specifically the urban Indian identity, as he describes. Um, quote, we know the sound of the freeway better than we do the rivers, says one, end quote, says one character. Um, also, there's graffiti culture, and there, um, there's Alcatraz, its history and modern uses. Um, and there's lots in there about storytelling, telling one story and hearing the stories of others. Um, there's opportunities to appreciate indigenous art and, and form new and deeper understanding about the, uh, understandings about the spiritual importance and artistry of powwows. Um, there are discussion questions online, and there's also a, a playlist on Spotify. It has songs he listened to while writing the novel or that appear in the novel. It includes, of course, There, There by Radiohead, um, but also A Change is Gonna Come by Otis Redding and music from a Twin Peaks episode. <laughs> and one more thing I'll say is the title of the book comes from a uh, Gertrude Stein, um, from Everybody's Autobiography from 1937. Um, concerning the fact that her childhood home in Oakland, California, no longer existed. So in other words, the there of her childhood was gone. So a programming idea could be one, how one's hometown or neighborhood has changed or hasn't changed and what that feels like. Next slide. So Natalie is also super excited to be part of the program and sent her apologies about not being able to do a video in time. And I wanted to share um, what she wrote, because it's just so poetic, not surprisingly, she wrote in an email, quote, pardon that I didn't get the video to you all. My body had a different idea of what I had the capacity for. I'm down for any other ways I can resound the book and the program. Love that. So Postcolonial Love Poem won the 2020, 2021 uh, Pulitzer Prize in Poetry and was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award in Poetry. It's groundbreaking, it's lyrical, it's lush, it's exquisite, and it is available in audio, which you know. Natalie was awarded a MacArthur Genius Award in 2018, and she's currently on the board of chancellors for the Academy of American Poets. She teaches at Arizona State University, and she spends a good deal of time and is passionate about preserving the Mojave language. She's also a basketball player. She played for Old Dominion, Old Dominion University in Virginia where she went to college and they made the final four. And so she got to travel internationally. So violence against native peoples and the legacy of colonization are driving engines of the book. Um, and there's also an exploration of mental illness and substance abuse, which could spark some powerful programming, but also this collection, um, which I think is mostly meant for mature audiences, I would say, 
is a love poem, though it takes the topical, the typical approach to the form and turns it into something different, something new. But that can lead to some interesting programming ideas, we thought, with audience responding with their own love poems to their history, their community, their legacy, their loved ones, their past, present, and future selves. Next slide. Nothing to see here is really funny and really heartfelt, if you haven't read it. It's peculiar, it's bizarre, and totally authentic, just like all of his novels. Um, it was on many best book of the year list and was a read with Jenna today show book club pick. And in fact, you can see a great five minute interview with Kevin on the today show. It's available online where he talks about key themes of the book, including parenting and unconditional love. Um, the novel takes place in Suwannee, Tennessee, and and there's basketball in it, too, because there's two friends, um, both of whom play or used to play in college. Um, Kevin teaches in Suwannee and lives there with his wife and two little boys, so you can guess at some of his inspiration. I think all of us who are parents can relate to what our kids' tantrums feel like. Um, and I will say the novel is available in audio and braille. Next slide. The Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude has won all sorts of awards, including the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Kingsley Tufts Prize, and was a finalist for the National Book Award and the NAACP Image Award. And it really does live in the realm of joy and gratitude and delight, which marks a lot of Ross's work, um, albeit from a perspective of deep curiosity and, and sometimes deep sorrow and sometimes just from everyday things. He has poems in his collection titled, Ode to Buttoning and Unbuttoning My Shirt and Sharing with the Ants. He's big into gardening, by the way. So that's a big theme and one that's good for programming. So you might check out his interview on the podcast, On Being with Krista Tippett from 2019. It's called Tending Joy and Practicing Delight. Um, Quote, to be with gay, says Tippett, quoting her here, is to train your gaze to see the wonderful alongside the terrible to attend to and meditate on what you love. Um, you might also check out his book, Book of Delights, um, which is an inspiring collection of little pieces he wrote every day over the course of the year, tasking himself with finding something that delighted him, which is, I thought, also a good pro programming idea to have audiences create their own books of delight and gratitude. One more thing about Ross, he's a founding editor with Carissa Jen and Patrick uh, Rosal, of the online sports magazine, some call it Ballin. Look it up, he's a sports fan. So there you go. Next up, Infinite Country was named a most anticipated book before it arrived by more than like 20 major news outlets, huge. It was a Reese's book club pick and Amazon best book of the month. It's poignant, it's urgent, it's intimate, stunning, a story of loss and love and hope. It is available in audio. And there is a reading group guide with discussion questions on the publisher's website, uh, Simon & Schuster. And the guide includes what they call thoughts to enhance your book club, which might be interesting, as well as a conversation with Patricia. So there's a lot to program around um, with themes of storytelling and the idea of home and of course, Colombian myths and legends and culture. Booklist gave it a starred review and recommended it for young adult readers. And so you might consider this for both adult and young adult readers. In fact, Talia, who's a character in the novel, she's a strong-willed teenager in the story, is named after um, Talia Shire, the actress who plays Adrian Panino um, Balboa in Rocky, in the Rocky franchise. So in the book, Elena, her mom thinks Talia is, quote, much tougher than the boxer. <laughs> Next up. Heartland was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Kirkus Prize and was on many best books of the year lists, including President Barack Obama's list. It's insightful, it's honest, it's nuanced, it's deeply um, humane, and it really does have wide appeal, as demonstrated already since it's been out, to people from all political backgrounds and from all parts of the country, not just the Heartland. In fact, um, it was recommended to us by a librarian in Baltimore. It's available in audio and braille, and there is a reader's guide on the publisher's website, um, Simon & Schuster, um, with discussion questions and a link to an interview with Sarah and related articles. And I'll mention 
also that Sarah has a particular fondness for Dolly Parton. You might check out Sarah's most recent book called She Comes By It Natural, Dolly Parton and the Woman Who Lived Her Songs. Next up. Interior Chinatown won the National Book Award last year. It's funny, it's inventive, it's surreal, tender, a send up of Hollywood tropes and Asian American stereotypes. In fact, Emily St. John Mandel, author of Station Eleven and one of our most beloved big read authors uh, books, calls it, quote, wrenching, hilarious, sharp, surreal, and above all, original. This is an extraordinary book, she writes. The novel is available in audio and braille, and the novel's publisher, Penguin Random House, also selected it as a secondary education pick, offering up discussion questions and a teacher's guide on its site. So it's definitely a crossover book for adults and teens. And there's lots of programming possibilities around, among other things, film, Hollywood, and screenwriting, um, particularly since as it's written in parts like a script. Charles, in fact, writes for shows on FX, AMC, and HBO. And he was nominated for two Writers Guild of America Awards for his work on the HBO series, Westworld. And you might also like to check him out at this year's National Book Festival, where he did a, a presentation with uh, Daniel Evans. And one quick note, he and his main character are, are Taiwanese. Um, together with um, a group called TaiwaneseAmerican.org, he established the Betty L. Yu and Jin C. Yu uh, writing prizes in honor of his parents. Next up. Deaf Republic was a finalist for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, the T.S. Eliot Prize, so many, and also the Annis Field Wolf Book Award, which is given to books that have made important contributions to our understanding of racism and our appreciation of the rich diversity of human cultures. So it's an extraordinary book length narrative work, a parable in poems and a page turner. So it's not, it's, it's kind of different than other poetry books um, in that you really can and want to read it from beginning to end because it propels you forward with the narrative. You wanna find out what happens next. Um, Kevin Young, also a big read author, called it a quote, map of what it means to live in a peaceful country. So it's available in audio and braille. And you can find actually online the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards Young Adult Lesson Plan is what they call it, which is a downloadable, uh, a free downloadable um, um, teacher's guide. I think it includes full lesson plans for high school curriculum. Next up. Homegoing was on Oprah's Best Books of the Year list, and it won the Penn Hemingway Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. It's blazing, it's devastating, it's riveting, it's epic, and it covers so much time that there's so much to program. Um, she was born, Ya yeah, was born in Ghana and uh, raised in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, and she claims this like influences for her were uh, Toni Morrison, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, James Baldwin, Edward P. Jones, and Drupal Lahiri. Um, the novel is available in audio and Spanish, and the novel's publisher, um, Penguin Random House, also selected it as a secondary education pick, which again means that they offer up discussion questions and a teacher's guide on their website. So go check that out. Next up, The Bear could be called a novella because it, it kind of clocks in at only 224 pages, and it's so compelling. You, you could really read it in one sitting. I did. It's been critically acclaimed, it re received starred reviews across the board, and it's on several best book of the year lists. It's also one of Book Browse's recommended adult YA crossover novels, and I'd agree that it could definitely appeal to both adult and young adult audiences. The novel is available on audio, and there's a reader's guide from the publisher, which is Bellevue Literary Press. Just make sure that um, it's the one from Bellevue Literary Press and by Andrew Kravak, not the one from Hachette because there's another novel called The Bear. There's also a playlist to go along with the book that Andrew assembled uh, called Music to Read By, which you can find with the Reader's Guide on Bellevue Literary Press's website. And I'd also encourage you to check out Andrew's personal website where he includes a reflection on how he came to write The Bear um, which touches on some of what he talked about in the video, but it's really sweet. He talks about a story he used to tell his young sons and about being inspired by the mountain near his home and the book, The Animal Family by Randall Jarrell. Next up. Sitting Pretty is, is 
witty, it's fierce, it's touching, it's candid, it's groundbreaking. And Rebecca, as you can tell from the video, is just mesmerizing, really. She's a new mom. Her son, Otto, is about a year and a half uh, old. Um, and she lives in an old house built in 1895 in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, the book is available in audio and I totally appropriate for young adults. And I'd like to really strongly suggest that you check out two things. One is her Instagram account, which is at sitting underscore pretty, where she regularly writes about what it means to live in her, as she says, her particular disabled female body. And the other resource I want to point you to is a fantastic 30 minute interview on our website that our own Joe Reed on our NEA staff did with Rebecca almost exactly one year ago. Um, and maybe I'll ask Lauren to put the link up in the chat. Um, that would be great. Next up, The Cold Billions was um, on many best of the book year lists also. It was an Amazon best book of the month. It's bold, it's suspenseful, it's expansive, it's vibrant. Um, Jess is an award-winning Washington State author and journalist, and he's got seven novels under his belt, so you might check those out. He's been called the Steinbeck's modern heir. In fact, the title comes from a quote from Steinbeck. He comes from blue-collar roots and loved adventure stories when he was growing up, and his dad, in fact, was a longtime um, president of a steelworkers union. So there's lots of ideas for programming, as he indicates. The novel is available in audio. And you can find discussion questions online. And the last three books are books that were uh, popular books that we're bringing, just continuing on or bringing back that were on the big um, read list. And we're just continuing on with them because they, they, we felt that they fit with this list. And maybe I'll also have Lauren post the, in the chat the links to each individual book. Um, and so the first up is uh, next one is The Best We Could Do. You know, as a graphic memoir that began as an oral history project, there's so many possibilities for programming with this terrific book. And I'd encourage you to check out, for example, because there are already grantees already programming with it, um, the website for Broward County Library in Florida. Um, they're programming this book. They're going to program this book in January, and they're doing an event called What's Your Story? Learn How to Conduct a Family History Interview to Capture and Preserve Your Family's Immigration Experience. And the Vietnamese American Arts and Letters Association in California also received a grant and they're programming the book and doing an event called Gallery Beyond Walls, which will bring right teaching artists into the local community to teach about various um, art skills. So the book's going to be an inspiration for participants um, creations and at the end of the workshops, uh, they'll exhibit the artwork produced by the community at a local gallery. I'll also say that sometime soon we're going to add to our website more information and resources for communities about the book, including short essays about the Vietnam War, the 1980 Refugee Act, the history of the graphic novel form, and lots of suggestions for companion titles, including a few children's books illustrated by T, pronounce it T Bui. So check those out. Next up, Cersei. I just, here I'll share up front that Circe is available on audio, braille, and in Spanish. And also that it won the 2019 Alex Award. So it's, and if you don't know, the Alex Award is given to books that were written for adults, but have a special appeal to young adults. And it was named a best, also named a best adult book for teens by School Library Journal. So it really is. And um, I can tell you that the uh, for uh, some programming that already took place that we will share, like the you say the Massillon Museum in Ohio did an event called Greek, "Creating a Greek Amphora and Reiku Firing Demo." Uh, an amphora I learned is an ancient storage jar. Um, they encourage participants to learn and experience traditional clay and firing techniques through a local ceramic studio. Um, another grantee, the city of Germantown in Tennessee, hosted a kickoff event in which um, all ages were invited to learn to write their name in Greek. And they picked up a craft kit and they had a visit with a local farmer who um, talked to them about herbs and they were able to take home a plant to tend. Um, and then uh, the grantee gave away uh, copies of the book, but they also gave away copies of um, companion books like um, the Percy Jackson books for young readers. 
Attle Attleboro Public Library in Massachusetts hosted a history of the witch persecutions lecture via Zoom. Um, they talked about that topic and its rel relevancy to current world events. And the Cascade Public Library in Idaho hosted um, an event called Celebrating Our Earth, um, where they um, talked about plants and herbology referenced in, in Circe and, um, uh, and to Earth Day. Uh, and so uh, folks explored health remedies from local herbs and plants and berries. And the last book is Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? Um, the avail uh, the, uh, uh, this is available in audio. And I wanna point you to our webpage for this graphic memoir where if you scroll all the way down, you can find on our website on this page, you can find a link to a really terrific podcast with Roz. Um, and I'll share just a couple of things. The University of Georgia did a fun event um, called Can't We Dance About Something More Pleasant? <laughs> where they had dancers responding to chess book um, and they posted those responses to Instagram. Um, uh, they did another event called and I hesitate here, my aging face, a conversation on aging, beauty, and redefining norms for women over 40 and gallery display. And the Ellsworth Public Library in Maine, this is still going, they're preparing to do something called getting your, your affairs in order, where they're doing a two session workshop on estate planning. And they have something that they are working on called an intergenerational correspondence kit, where they're going to provide grab and go kits to encourage kids to connect with older adults in the community, which is awesome. And that is all I have to say about the books. And so um, I'm going to open it up to my fine colleagues um, to say, did I miss anything, you guys? Or is there anything that strikes you that you want to add? <clears throat> and um, I'll also open it up to. Happy to answer any questions. Over to you, Josh. Hi, everyone. Feel free to submit questions you have um, about any of the books you saw here today or the application process. By the way, the application for the 2022 and 2023 opportunity that these books pertain to is on January 26th. Um, and uh, our colleague John at Arts Midwest is going to facilitate any Q&A that we have, or um, if you just wanna comment on any of the books in the chat, you're welcome to do that too, but we've made this time for you to um, get your reactions, get your feedback, get your questions that you have for us now that the Arts Midwest and NEA are on the line with you. While we're waiting, I will say I feel awful, but I meant to say, and I forgot that I am a white female and my pronouns are she, hers, and um, I'm wearing glasses and a black sweater and that behind me are lots of books and Mr. Pickle, which is a green stuffed toy handed down to me by my 10 year old son. <laughs> Looks like we have a question from Judy in the chat um, that says, I know one of the books costs more than $20. Are there any thoughts about costs and also speaker fees? Um, so I can talk a little bit about um, costs uh, related to the budget and application. So um, we do recommend that you, uh, when you're building your application, reach out to book wholesalers and also the publishers to kind of get a price quote on the amount of books that you think you'll need to facilitate some of your programs, depending on the size of the community that you'll want to reach. Um, and also you might consider um, in terms of speaker fees, if you're thinking about the bringing the author in, which I'll just preface by saying is not required, um, but oftentimes authors uh, were amenable to coming in person or doing a virtual appearance. And sometimes a virtual appearance, oftentimes I should say, I should say is significantly a lower cost than an in-person um, gig. Um, speaker fees can vary pretty dramatically depending on what you propose that they do in the community, but there have been authors that just 
um, show up for a one-off event. And sometimes uh, communities often opt to have authors show up in multiple places like a school or a juvenile correctional facility and also at an auditorium. So it all kind of depends on uh, what you're proposing in terms of book quantities and what you would like the, uh, how do you like the author to engage uh, your community? I'll ask John which one he wants us to handle next. Thanks, Jess. There's a question here about, is there a place to find suggested age range for each book? Amy, I'll toss that to you and Lauren. Yeah, there we there really there isn't. We did a Lauren did some research um, to try and find out which of these books were specifically mentioned as crossover, and that's when we found that online. We mentioned it. Um, I hesitate to say uh, for, uh, in I, in any um, solid terms because I think it's community by community um, and what you feel comfortable with. Um, uh, but the answer is no, I haven't found there's, we don't have any one place where we can say it's from this age to this age. This program is designed primarily as an adult reading program. And um, although we understand that um, it has appeal for schools and other age groups, we want that because it's also a community, it's a community project. So if the particular book um, is not meant for, if we didn't say that it was, um, that others didn't feel that it was for a young adult audience, um, uh, we encourage you to find companion titles that that work in that way. Lauren, does that is that what you? Yeah, no, you described it perfectly and exactly. I think companion titles is the perfect way to fill out if you want to engage younger audiences. Great. Next up, there is a question here about collaboration. Uh, if we anticipate collaborating with another organization, should both organizations apply or should we simply nod to the collaboration in our application? Josh, do you want to tackle this one? Sure, um, I'll tackle this one. I guess my recommendation is to have one of the organizations apply and decide which one would be the support uh, organizer. So one would take the lead and submit the application um, and then reference that other organization as a key partner in XYZ ways, whether it's promotion or programming um, or just providing space or human resources, whatever it might be. Now that's not to say that the other org could not apply themselves, but if we get two applications from one community reading the same book that will be a little bit awkward. So that I would definitely recommend consolidating if you're in the same community and um, forming um, a committee of sorts. So an application committee on behalf of the community and gather people around in person, if that makes sense, or Zoom to kind of clarify roles and uh, who would be submitting the application and taking the lead and then sharing out resources from there. So that would definitely be my recommendation. Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in and say thank you for asking about collaboration. I kind of love hearing that. I mean, we understand like even the about the author fees. They're sometimes they're they're expensive, and we've had experience. I know at least some grantees have come together and collaborated on an event and and saved costs there. And we've also talked a lot. Um, over the years about how we can redefine community. There's so much of that comes in and that where a community is defined geographically, but what if a, a community is defined in another way, you know, by an, a topic we like for um, police or uh, healthcare workers or some, you know, in various geographic areas, then they, there, there can be some real good collaboration coming in as one application in the future. So it's exciting to think about. Yeah, and I noticed a, um, a question, I just wanna to speak to about speaker fees a little bit further and just reiterate that um, while I understand having the author in the community is a great value add, um, if 
author fees are outside of um, a budgetary range. Um, other speakers could include uh, local luminaries. Um, if you have a university or college that's not too far away um, with someone who could speak to some of the themes of the book, that's also um, another option to consider. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Keep the questions coming. We got about a couple minutes left. And I will just say, if no questions come to you um, in the two or so minutes that we have left, I wanted to have um, John put our contact information in the chat um, for um, him and I at Arts Midwest um, so that we can address any questions that you have leading into the application that will be, again, coming up with a deadline at the end of January on the 26th. We can definitely um, help you conceptualize an application um, to a certain extent. We can't provide coaching, um, but we can help it help you frame it up so that you can um, put your best foot forward in terms of that application. All right, I don't see any more questions coming in. Oh, let me see. We um, have one, would schools or universities need a DUNS number? And I'm glad you asked this because um, all applicants do need a DUNS number. The, uh, right now, this is a Dunn and Bradstreet uh, number. So if you Google that, or maybe John or Lauren could throw the link up in the chat for what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, and this is a number that's uh, free to obtain. It's relatively quick and simple. And it is a number that essentially tracks where federal government spending is, is going to. It's a nine digit number. You'll need to include it in your application. Um, towards the spring of next year, as we get through the panel decision process and we find out uh, from them who the next uh, set of 70 or so grantees are gonna be, we will walk you through a transition process um, from a DUNS number to what's gonna be a UEI number. So there's a transition there. I won't go into greater detail here because our time is up, but just know that for this question here, you will need a DUNS number and then we'll guide you through the next steps um, as it pertains to that um, with applications coming in. Josh, this uh, webinar will be available Second. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna make some polishing edits to the webinar, we're gonna clean up the author video a little bit, make it real nice and pretty, and then we'll have it um, available in the coming days and everyone who registered for the webinar will get a email um, notice that it has been posted. And then if you're also on the Arts Midwest um, grants newsletter, you'll probably get an email there as well. So sorry for spamming everybody, but we just wanna make sure you have the content that you need to be successful. So I just wanna thank everybody for joining us today for Amy Stoles and Lauren Miller at the NEA for providing a whole bunch of extra content for us to really dig into these books and think about which ones would work well in the communities. And as I mentioned again, Arts Midwest is here to help you through the application process. The contact information was shared by John, so please get in touch with us if you would like. And we hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.